Since 2004, in 14 series, the documentary has regularly brought audiences of over 6 million to the BBC and has been successfully developed in other countries around the world. A growing interest in family history is fueled by easier access to online records and even DNA tests. And I know some members of our church families have found fascinating facts about their background. We have within us a desire to find out more about who we are. And we also, I think, find it helpful sometimes to learn more clearly what we're for, what drives us and what's our purpose in life. A few years ago, I was on a, a leadership training programme that involved quite a bit of that kind of reflection, and drawing up a personal vision statement, which has been uh, really helpful to me as an individual and as a, a leader. And this applies to human organisations at least as much as to human individuals. When we find ourselves unable to do much of what we want to do or much of what we've always done, it can drive us back to ask the questions of what essentially are we for? The church is facing these questions as much as any organisation. And so it's helpful for us to look back and see what's in our DNA as a church, where we came from, and have a better understanding of who we are and what we're for. And for the local church, St Nick's, which is part of the church worldwide and all through history, it helps us to understand, if we can understand where the church as a whole came from and what it's for, what God has put St Nicholas Church on earth and in Barthampton for. We're coming to the end of Paul's major letter to the Romans. The main part of his argument is complete. He set out the gospel message of how God in his great mercy sent his son Jesus to die for us so that despite our rebellion against him we can turn back to God and receive forgiveness and new eternal life in the risen Jesus. He's shown us how God's big plan for the world was focused on Jesus through promises made to Abraham and the people of Israel, opened up then to people of every race grafted into the tree by faith with the hope that the Israelites will turn to Jesus and receive the benefit of being God's people, God's true people. And he's explained then how to live in response to God's mercy offering our bodies to God as living sacrifices in the community of faith that is the church. Now, and in the final chapter, which we'll look at next week, Paul gets personal with the Romans. He's never met them, but he wants to. He told them back in chapter one that he wanted to see them. He's heard about them. The news about this community of people at the heart of the world empire whose lives have been changed by Jesus has spread all around the world. So Paul in writing to them has set out his message, the gospel, in a systematic way that will remind and encourage them and that's easily transferred to our context and all over the world. To Christians throughout history. And now he shares with them who he thinks he is, what God has put him on earth for, and in doing so he sheds light on what the church is for, what the church is, and what God has put us on earth for. The important thing for us to understand about Paul or Saint Paul, as many people like to call him, although saint is a word that can rightly be applied to any and every Christian and so doesn't, strictly speaking, distinguish this Paul from many other Christian Pauls we may know. The distinguishing point about this Paul is that he is an apostle. That's how he introduced himself back in chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the service of God, for the gospel of God. 
Paul explains much more in his letter to the Galatians what it means to be an apostle. It means being part of the foundation of the faith. The apostles saw and knew the risen Lord Jesus and received the message directly from Jesus, not through anybody else. They were commissioned directly by Jesus to pass on this message, which would then be written down as the New Testament. That means that the apostles had the full authority of Jesus to speak his words. It means that they are different from subsequent teachers like me and others we may listen to. I can teach authoritatively, but my teaching is only authoritative in as much as it's faithful to the teaching of the apostles, that is, to the New Testament. There's no guarantee otherwise that my teaching will be faithful in the way that the apostles' teaching is guaranteed. So you need to be discerning as you listen. You need to check in general, when you hear someone like me teaching, preaching, check that what I'm saying comes from the Bible and think carefully about it and beware anyone who claims to have apostolic authority who was born in the last 2000 years. The apostles were all from Jesus' generation, commissioned by him to lay the foundation on which we the second and subsequent generations all build. Now, I know some people use the word apostolic in a different way, mistakenly in my view, to refer to being pioneers and they aren't claiming the authority of the apostles. And some of them are faithful people and I'm not writing them off for using language differently. We need to listen carefully to discern what they are actually claiming for themselves in relation to scripture. Paul, as well as being an apostle, was different from the other apostles, the 12. He was unique in two particular ways. One is that Paul wasn't following Jesus before his resurrection. He had a special encounter with Jesus where the Lord famously stopped him on the Damascus road. Nevertheless, Paul was given the message directly by Jesus and not through the other apostles. He referred to this unique start to his Christian life as being one abnormally born the odd one out amongst the apostles, as he didn't receive the message by listening to Jesus for three years before seeing Jesus die and rise again. The other unique thing about Paul's apostleship in the, is the particular role that Jesus gave him. Whereas the others spoke mainly to Jews, the Lord Jesus called Paul the Jew to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And with these things in mind from Paul's background, knowing who he thinks he is, Paul opens his heart and shares with the Roman Christians he's never met what he thinks he's doing. And here are three important features of his ministry. And I hope you don't mind a bit of alliteration because they all begin with P. First, Paul's ministry was a priestly ministry. Let me read verse 16 where he talks about the grace God gave him to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God sanctified by the Holy Spirit therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God this is an Old Testament illustration of Paul's service, like the service of a priest. The Old Testament priests in Israel were the ones who made sacrifices to God in the temple. Now, over the last few hundred years, this has been misunderstood in some churches where we call our ministers priests in thinking that we, we make a sacrifice to God on behalf of the people 
in the New Covenant communion service. The very opposite is what's happening actually in a communion service. We're remembering Jesus's once for all sacrifice and receiving from him. But in a sense, every Christian has a priestly duty, as in verse 16 here, of proclaiming the gospel of God. That's how Paul saw his role. Because when he told people the gospel and they put their trust in Jesus, those new Christians became a kind of offering to God. We're not talking about a, a sin offering or a, an atonement offering here but a thank offering, a way of giving praise to God, just as we give our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual act of worship. So Paul is giving the people that he has won for Jesus to Jesus as a thank offering. In the Old Testament, they used to burn some of their grain and make a pleasing aroma to the Lord as a way of thanking him. And that's what the church is in Paul's way of speaking here, the gift that's given to God. And so it is for the roles of the church. Our, our calling is to worship God and our worship is glorifying God, proclaiming him to the nations and to everybody and as we witness to what God has has done so people then turn to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and worship him and so the witness leads to worship and the worship leads to witness and the witness leads to worship and it goes on in a virtuous circle. So as founder of churches Paul's role is priestly offering people to God and Paul's special role as apostle to the Gentiles meant that it was not just one nation, but all the nations that he was offering to God. And Paul's ministry was a powerful ministry. There's uh, a lot of striking things in verses 18 and 19. It may raise questions for us that might be discussed in home groups later on in the week. Clearly, Paul is saying here that his ministry changed people's lives. The objective of his ministry was Gentile obedience, that is bringing the nations under the Lordship of Christ. This is all done by Christ and for Christ. Paul didn't see himself as doing his own work, that he was changing people's lives, but rather it was work done by Jesus and Paul was Christ's agent. The power in his ministry was shown in the word and the works, the word of the gospel and the working of miracles and also other works, good things that Paul and others did, having been empowered by the Holy Spirit. The source of his power was the Holy Spirit. So a priestly ministry and a powerful ministry and Paul's ministry distinctively was a pioneer ministry. In verse 20 Paul explained that his ambition, he said it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. That's not to say that it would be wrong for someone to build on another's another person's foundation, of course. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he said, I planted a seed, Apollos watered it, God made it grow. So we work as a team. And so it is for all of us Christians, we work as a team. If you get into conversation with a friend and you end up inviting them to church when we're meeting again as church or to the live stream and I preach the gospel and you introduce them to another friend who invites them to home group and they end up praying with with Phil and Molly at the end of the service and 
praying with someone else and, and they end up eventually giving their life to Jesus. We've worked as a team. Paul was actually a member of that team in passing on for us the message that we then shared together with the other person. He was at the start of the chain after Jesus. The life and growth of St Nicholas Church has been a team effort. I haven't, and we in the church now haven't, planted a new church here. We're building on the foundations laid by others before us, continuing the work that went, under, went on under St Paul Burden before me, and the work of a long chain of other saints going back hundreds of years before him. And the first St Paul, with his unique apostolic role, always wanted to go to new places. He had been all around the Eastern Mediterranean, as you can see on this map, and you may have a map like this in the back of your Bible, um, and they're easily found on the internet as well. Um, three circuits that Paul did with a strategy of visiting the major cities in this whole Eastern Mediterranean region and preaching the gospel in each city, establishing new churches who would then form bridgeheads from which they would fan out into the surrounding villages and countryside, preaching the gospel to everyone in the whole region. Each time a church was established, Paul would move on and work on establish, planting and establishing another church in another city. And he kept in touch with those people from the previous city, wrote to them and visited them again, because he went round this circuit three times. But he was always moving on and going to new places. So he saw his role as fulfilling the Isaiah prophecy that we read earlier this morning. And he quoted from Isaiah 52, those who were not told about him will see and those who have not heard will understand. So Paul talks about his intention to visit Rome, which would be an exception to his normal policy because that wasn't a new place for the gospel. The gospel had already been preached there before Paul got there. The foundation has been laid by someone else, but before he can go to Rome, he needs to make another journey. And after Rome, he has another destination in mind, Spain. In those days, traveling thousands of miles was quite risky and a big deal, but Paul talks about these trips quite matter of factly. And he mentions to the Romans, Roman Christians in this letter at this point, three parts to his future plans. First, visit Jerusalem. He's heard about famine in Judea, Christians in Jerusalem being particularly hard hit. And so he's encouraged the wealthier Gentile Christians in the Greek provinces to collect up money to send to them. And he's got this big bag of money to deliver himself and make sure that it gets there safely and ensure that it's well received by these Jewish Christians. They are more religiously conservative and in the terms that, that Paul has been using in the previous couple of chapters, uh, weak compared to the liberated Gentile Christians. And this gift is an important experience expression of gratitude from the richer brothers to the poorer. Those Gentiles had received everything spiritually from the Jews because Jesus was a Jew and within the people of God, the Jewish people, the people of Israel who'd received the promises given to Abraham. And so as they had been grafted in to the tree so they owed it to the Jewish Christians 
from whom they'd received spiritual blessing and the nourishing sap from the Jewish root, they owed it to them to share their material blessings. So the first part of Paul's future travel plans was go to Jerusalem immediately to give this money away. And the second part, then at last he could visit Rome as he's been longing to do to see these Christians that he's writing to. He needs to leave the Eastern Mediterranean because his job is done there. The gospel has reached all the regions there. Not to say that everybody has heard the gospel yet, but there are people in all these places preaching the gospel and taking it to everybody. So, so Paul, the pioneer, has a plan to head westward and pioneer even further west than Rome, stopping at Rome on the way to encourage the Christians there and also to get the Roman Christians to support him in his onward mission, to pray for him, to refresh him, to give him supplies to take on his next journey. And then the goal is take the gospel to Spain, the western end of the known world. Now we don't know whether he ever made it to Spain. The way the story pans out according to Luke's account in Acts is that he went to Jerusalem, was well received by the church, was attacked by those who hated the message of Jesus there in Jerusalem, was arrested and was shipped off to Rome under arrest. He certainly arrived via a shipwreck but there in Rome the book of Acts finishes with Paul under house arrest writing letters and preaching the gospel under lockdown. We know from other sources that Paul eventually was executed in Rome, so I don't think he ever went to Spain as he intended, although I'm not sure and some people think that he was released and went to Spain and later on was arrested and brought back to Rome under Nero's persecution and then executed. When we pray and when we make plans, we always have to have the caveat if it's God's will. So we talk about future plans, but we can't be sure whether things will pan out as we are planning. And if COVID-19 is teaching us anything, maybe that's one of the lessons. So many of our plans went out of the window with lockdown, but God knows what he's doing so look at Paul's prayer request to the Romans in verses 30 to 32. And the first request was praying for safety. And in fact, he was attacked by those unbelievers in Judea, as he had feared. His prayer for safety was answered in that he was safe from lynching by being arrested. So perhaps not quite the way he had envisaged in asking for that prayer. It seems that the gift he took to Jerusalem was well received as uh, in verse 30, towards the end of verse 31, he said, pray that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there. And what about his prayer about going to Rome? Was that answered? Yes, he got to Rome although again not in the way that he would have chosen, in chains. I think so often when, when we pray we need to be ready for God to answer in his way rather than in our way. And I expect you've found this sometimes, haven't you, when you pray that you get your prayer answered and it wasn't quite what you were imagining, hoping for. Um, be careful what you pray for. Last year, I had started praying a prayer of Bishop J.C. Ryle, the first Bishop of Liverpool, um, from a long time ago, a prayer for gospel ministers. And um, the start of that prayer is, or the prayer request is, pray that we may be kept humble and sensible of our own weakness and ever mindful that in the Lord alone can we be strong. And I feel very much that God answered that prayer for me. I hadn't imagined that this was asking for a broken neck, but that was used certainly. My accident 
and my limitations were made very clear to me and I became extra aware of my own weakness and reliance on God and his strength. The Lord knows what he is doing and he has a big plan for getting his good news of Jesus the risen Lord out to every nation. So the Gideons UK are doing that in this country, getting Bibles out to people who otherwise wouldn't read the Bible. It's going on all over the world and even under lockdown, churches everywhere are preaching the gospel and people everywhere are tuning in and listening and God's plan is being fulfilled and it started well, it started from eternity past and it was all in God's plan in the in the promises but from the good news first going completely public with Jesus resurrection announced then uh, and recorded by the apostles and proclaimed as Paul went round laying these foundations in new places it has reached us and it is going on reaching and so that's in our DNA as a church that we need to be reaching out with the good news so uh, as we praise God for what he's done we let other people know they turn to God, to Jesus, and they become an offering that brings more praise and worship to God. So may our witness and our worship keep this cycle going that was started through Paul. Thanks be to God.